We, potentially against their will, have shot a lot of 308 recently. Uh, bankruptcy is close. We're going to have to sell the dog. Right, because we wanted to dip our toe into 308, and we accidentally we dove all the way into the pool. Yeah. So we want to talk about that today. This isn't the battle rifle. This isn't the Sapper POU. It's just simply our experience with these different rifles, because AR-10s are not AR-15s. You can't just pick one off the rack and be fairly confident you're going to get a consistent experience. Go. Man, 308. 308 is a tough market because you've got a bunch of antique battle rifles that didn't last long. They didn't have a lot of development time in the military, you know, because they they were introduced in the 50s and discontinued in the 60s, essentially, like as people started adopting intermediate cartridges. So we want 308, but history has decided that 308 was not a good cartridge. You know what time it is. It's time to pay the channel bills. This video is sponsored by Venture Surplus. Hey, hey, stop skipping forward. Watch the ad. Look, look, it's getting cold, and in some places, really cold. A telltale sign when I go camping with newer, inexperienced winter campers is they either show up in a ski jacket or they show up with regular around town cold weather gear. Layering here is key, doubly so in any tactical environment where effort is expected to be exerted. This thing here today is the level two military ECWCS layering system. But because we're not nerds, nor can we afford $700 cold weather systems, we're just gonna call it the waffle topper. The waffle topper is really sort of a cheating catch-all piece of clothing, as a lot of you in the military already know. It acts as a great piece of layering for the colder months, and as it gets really cold, a double base layer. But as you or the seasons heat up, it kind of works great as an outer layer, almost like a sweater. While not carrying the downsides of said sweater, like weight and tendency to get and stay wet. Throw one of these on, you're generally good to go while moving, and as the situations get colder, you pile stuff on top. You know, it's a layering system. Venture Surplus bought a shitload of these things for you. Yes, you specifically. These typically cost a fair bit, but you can get them right now for $24.99. Add in my discount code for even more savings. And uh, yeah, go ahead and do some cold weather camping. So first rifle, uh, 716, your beloved. R run me through your experience with this thing. You love this thing. Yeah, I love the 716, and it never did anything to like, like disappoint me or like horrify me. Like it was very reliable. I could put a can on and it didn't like turn to shit. Like it kept running. It was over gas, sure, but like it, it worked. The accuracy was adequate. It's a 16 inch barreled gun. I wasn't expecting like half minute, and I could get, if I used the right ammo, about a minute groups perfectly good now that's not necessarily me endorsing the concept of like battle rifles in 308 i'm just saying that like as far as the 716 goes it's a good rifle yeah because the indian the indian army is is, is the main user of the this 716, is right? yeah the indian military adopted the 716i which is the direct impingement version I understand that, like, the Indian military adopting something isn't, like, the strongest endorsement. A lot of people are going to say that actually counts against it. Again, they adopted the INSAS, which is one of the worst modern service rifles. You think the L85 was bad? No, the INSAS is so much worse. But yeah, as far as, like, the rifle does exactly what it's supposed to do. It's a great rifle. There's not much innovation in the 716i. It really is, like, it's an LR308 at heart. It's not, they're not like doing crazy stuff with the gas system or anything. Like it's a, it's a very basic rifle with a good rail, good everything is like well set up on that thing. The proprietary nature of it, I know a lot of people see that and they get freaked out because they're like, what if I need a new bolt carrier group? Like how many bolt carrier groups have you destroyed in your other rifles? I assume the number is zero because that's the number that everybody has destroyed. If you want it, you can buy a replacement bolt carrier group for the 716i. Granted, it costs $480, which is why I haven't bought one yet. Uh, but they are available, technically, and that's really the only wear part that's likely to, to you know, yeah, to, go, to go dead. Ball, yeah, exactly. So, you know, a bar barrel life should be adequate because it's a 4150 barrel, it's not stainless. You're not, it's not a super high pressure barrel burner cartridge. So, yeah, proprietary does kind of suck, but you don't need to replace anything. It's not like one of those rifles where you're like, I know I'm gonna buy that and then immediately order a whole bunch of aftermarket shit to fix the problems. It doesn't have any problems. It's fine. So uh, when I bought mine, it was like a screaming deal because nobody liked them. And I think it was like 1250. And now they might go have gone back up to their 15, normal price, 16. which is about 1500. Yeah. MSRP is probably like 1800, but of course they don't sell for that. 
Seems, seems to be good. You, I remember you came out for o Operation Mudslide, as we as we called it. Utah's uh, Rasputitsa, yeah, the mud this, season. This was like, and, uh, you christened your brand new Subaru by just caking it in an in and probably blowing out the tires. Permanent clay, and, uh, yep. Suspension. You know, Hop doesn't get to do too much long range because he lives in fucking little rock pits. And you did, you held your own in a long range, 400, 500, 600, through a blizzard, and this gun, this gun got you through. Didn't malfunction, completely dried out. Good rifle. Woo! I'm erect. Moving on, the uh, SCAR, the Mark 17, uh, kind of a legendary rifle in a lot of ways. I primarily ran this thing at a, well, another time with Hop. We, weird how that works, we need the, there's something to be said that we blasted through the SCAR review in about eight days or something like that, with the majority of it being in three days. Yeah, so we have we have a lot of rounds through the scar, you might say. Of course he does. But there is something to be said for like shooting it a little bit, going home, thinking about it, holding it, it was five going days. back to the range, thinking like what else I'm gonna do with this. So it's, it's, a, it's an aggressive testing schedule, but. I also didn't own the scar, so it was configured in a way that we all agreed about 0.1 seconds in was it was ridiculous. It was configured with a quad rail. This needs the M block. Uh, what is it called? Uh, kinetic was it kinetic? Who, who I cannot remember who. Uh, yeah. So I guess that's the thing with a scar. To me, like if all you want is a reliable hard use gun out of the box, the scar is probably cream of the crop because it's one of the best quality, most well tested rifles. But if you're really planning to do what you do with your regular ARs, which is, you, you know, you, you want stuff on lights, it. night vision, slings, all that stuff, the scar really becomes annoying because you're going to have to replace a bunch of parts before you can even accessorize it the way that you want it. So the scar, um, I think this is one of the things me and, me and Hop disagree about most, probably. Hop says it's the muscle break, which is a large part of the stuff. Excellent. Uh, it's a large part of the... <laughs> Wow. So here's, yeah, so what Brock is saying, the, the SCAR shoots pretty good for a 308. The 7.16 shoots pretty good for a 308. And the 7.16 comes with a three-prong flash hider and the SCAR comes with a three-port gamer break. Fuck. It's so concussive. And my theory the is PWS, that, yeah. yeah, my theory is that the SCAR only shoots good because of that break. Because it's a piston gun, we know piston guns don't shoot as good as DI guns. The 7.16 shoots well because they really obsessively tuned it. They lightened the bulk carrier group. It's a 16-inch rifle gas, which is a weird-ass fucking configuration. Yeah. I think when people say the SCAR shoots well, they're no, basically they're being bad, tricked by the, by the muzzle brake. That's my theory. Okay. It could be wrong. So my, my counterpoint is I think the SCAR recoils fast, which is appreciative, or you, you appreciate it when you shoot all of these guns. That seem yeah, really you're not wrong about recoil that. Song, recoil cycles, where it, it's ka-chunk, okay, shoot, ka-chunk. Okay, shoot. With the SCAR, it feels like a DI gun where it's a violent experience. The gun pushes you back. You're able to uh, you're able to pull the trigger fa trigger faster. Also, That's the way that I describe a a straight blowback like nine mil, like yeah. an AR nine versus an MP5. The MP5 is so soft and so comfortable, but, but the recoil impulse is very slow. So even though shooting a direct blowback AR nine is very jarring, if you do your part, if you really you know if you, you really settle in. Part you can just hold it on. And it's like, yeah, I think I'm getting probably post-concussion syndrome because of all the rattling, but whatever. I'm holding it on target, I'm doing good. Same thing with the SCAR. Yeah, it doesn't matter how hard you're, you're pushing into the rifle. The SCAR gotta... pushes you hard, but it pushes you fast, and then all you gotta do is just, you know, all, you just gotta wait out the recoil, and then you're back on, you know, you're back doing your shit. Yeah, so there, there's something to be said about that. Right. Unfortunately, I, I don't know what the fuck FM is smoking. The price is just brutal. Like, what, what they, they, if we can still buy these things for two, what was it, two thousand dollars, two thousand five hundred dollars, it, it'd be cool. But the price has just gone up and up and up, and now we're sitting at three, three one MSRP, and, and you look at tax swap, and somehow they're four thousand dollars. Right. So I, I would say, like, you look at the scar and you compare that price to, for example, just the seven sixteen. I know I'm going to show the sig because um, I just love it. My beloved, I want to yeah. marry it. I just want to put a ring on it. You compare the prices and you're like, well, the SCAR costs more, but, you know, it's a better rifle. It's got a, an FN barrel. Cold Hammer Forge chrome-lined FN barrels. The best barrels ever in the fucking world. 
it's got all that scar stuff that you love so much. You're like, it's not that much more expensive. But remember that as soon as you get it home, you're gonna have to spend money on a rail for it. Yeah, the 716 out of, of the stuff. box is really I have not touched the 716. The only thing I replaced was the muzzle device, so now I have a QD for my suppressor. And that's, that's also an issue because we're not gonna get into this in this video, but it bears discussion points. Is a battle rifle really a thing? It, it's, ooh, it, I'm, I'm not sure it is. And, and, and the general consensus is no, it's not a thing. But with the 716, you're really close to a very usable DMR setup. The SCAR is horrific in terms of that thing. You're easily spending a thousand plus dollars to get the SCAR into a DM setup. No, the stock trigger's not very good and the replacement triggers are proprietary, so they're way more expensive. It's a Geisley trigger. You're putting a Geisley trigger. The SCAR, or the, sorry, the SCAR, the 716, you put whatever your favorite AR trigger is. You can put a Schmidt probably already $60 have one. trigger in that. And, it's and in fact, deal. I did. Oh, nice. Yeah, ultimately, I think I liked it the most. Luke liked it kind of, and then you liked it the least. And now I have to wait for Brock to get back from the bathroom. No, I mean, I, it's, I'm recording straight to the mic. Look at the style, the elegance, the green. Don't do it, kids. This is a lesson. Don't make anything you love your job. Case in point, this guy in front of us right here, right now. Miserable, dejected, knees have zero cartilage. Doesn't like any rifle he builds out. Goes on the internet and picks fights with people over OGS. Who are you talking to? I uh, know one! Okay, let's move on to the SFAR. That's honestly the darling right now. Are you of... sure I can't complain about the scar some more? Okay, so I think the SFAR is easily the darling right now of the three-way industry. I think it brought a lot of hope Shit. back because it does a couple things. It's cheap, which despite what everyone says, cheap does matter. Like three oh eight for three thousand dollars is unattainable for most people that want a three oh eight, which is ironically the people that don't shoot that much just due to the nature of their circumstance in life, they want a three oh eight because it appeals to that like lone man able to do a lot of fantasy, so and so. But 308s are prohibitively expensive. The SFAR is cheap, it's light, and it's it, it's AR-15 compatible. Hop, you shot a lot of SFAR. SFAR. Yeah, the SFAR is, it's affordable, and it, it made a lot of people, I think, excited. They were like, finally, a, a 308 that really doesn't weigh that much more than an AR-15. Seems like it. Because that's, that's something we do see quite a lot. Um, you step up to 308, you are increasing the cost of the rifle, the cost of the ammunition, the weight of the rifle, the weight of the ammunition, the size of the rifle, like everything scales up. Did I mention the cost? Did you mention the cost? Uh, I think we can keep mentioning the cost because it's such a it's big so problem. Bad. <laughs> it's so bad. I think a lot of people like, okay, this is a, a tangent, but a lot of people point to the cheapest bullshit ammo, but then the, but then the gun doesn't work or the or the accuracy doesn't work, or, or generally both. Yeah, we've been shooting a lot of this cheap ammo, and we've... and we, first of all, we can't get the guns to work on the ammo, and second of all, we can't get the, like, one of my rifles, I can't zero to that ammo. The ammo is so inaccurate, I can't get a zero. But, but yeah, SFAR. Yeah, so there's a lot, a lot about that super appealing. It's, you know, it seems like a more modern, or like a Gen 2 or whatever, and it is based off the DPMS LR308 Gen 2, where they said, hey, what if we just shrink this down? So the bolt carrier group of an AR-10 or an LR308 is way bigger and heavier than a 5.56 bolt carrier group. The receivers are much longer and heavier. Everything's just like scaled up, but the SFAR scales it back down and they, Really, the only thing that's bigger is the size of the chamber and the size of the bolt face. The bolt carrier group's the same size as an AR-15. The receiver set's basically the same size. So they're able to shrink it in size and drop the weight by a lot. So the SFAR is the weight of a normal AR-15, and it shoots 308, and it's cheap. Unfortunately, uh, I'm on my second serial number of SFAR, and I'm still struggling to get it to work. The part of the problem seems to be that they're, they're having a really hard time spacing the gas settings of the regulator. And I, 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 it makes sense, I guess, because it is, it's not an easy gun to tune because you reduce the mass of the bolt a lot 
but you still got the same pressure coming out the cartridge. So they're gonna have to do a really fine tightrope walk to get the gas port size and the gas regulator positions correct to cycle the gun reliably without just blowing it up. And it's, I, it doesn't really seem like they can do it. So it's a very, very interesting rifle. It's a, somewhat interesting as a platform because as it turns out, it is relatively customizable. It's just that Somebody other than Ruger should have probably made this. Hope someone else, and someone in fact did, it was, uh, it was POF, but their version is very expensive and I, it doesn't have a ton of reputation. So I'm not really, I'm not really sure what to say there. It's a, it's a cool idea and I really hope it gets developed more, but currently right. I've made multiple videos about videos. it. One on TFB, one on my channel. I will make more videos because I'm still working on it. It's a really appealing platform. It's probably the most appealing platform of the bunch. More than almost any other 308 rifle, I want the SFAR to work. Because I it, really, really want it to cool. do. Yeah, I want it to succeed. But it, you're gonna spend. A, oh fuck me. Okay, and Anderson. Let, yeah, let me ruin my life with the SFAR before you do anything. You're looking very contractor right now, Brock. With my YouTuber influencer glasses. Speaking of p things that people have a lot of experience with, no one has experience apparently with the AR Anderson AM10. Overall, out of the gate, it seems to solve a lot of the issues that the, the 716, the SCAR, and the SFAR seem to have. It's pretty accurate. It seems to just handle all ammo types pretty well. It's got a 4150 barrel. It's a 4150 Normal barrel. shit. It's, the Anderson is a very normal LR308 rifle. I don't think you'd have any problems getting accessory parts for it. It's it follows the pattern. There's nothing. You look at all four of their models and they're all, it's the same rifle with a fucking Schmidt trigger and a, a slightly different muzzle device. Uh, this is what I would expect a, a budget rifle should be. They're not cutting costs anywhere egregious. I think the only the only part where they, they probably cut costs in a way that is not a good way to cut costs would be the stock. The stock is not a good stock. You're gonna replace it, which means that's fake cost cutting. But everything else, the handguard, it's a good handguard, other than the fact that you're gonna burn your fingerprints off, but they're honest, well, they're honestly doing a, uh, doing a favor for you. You know, everyone's got some pistol stocks that they need to get rid of. So, you know, burning, burning off your fingerprints, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, you know, reduce your, your fingerprint on, the, on society. Here uh, come the men in black. So I, I think it's actually a really impressive rifle. It handles all ranges of ammunition. There's nothing, stupid about it the price is a thousand bucks it seems like this should have been it but unfortunately at least for mine it's not very reliable and I, i'd love to say mine is a sample size of one you know buyer beware but you know it's just not reliable yeah we've you know at least the last couple days that i've been here we have experienced some bizarre issues with that rifle that don't make a lot of sense on paper like there's nothing about it that seems like it should be causing that problem you know like at least when i, I throw a can on my m5 or whatever or like I, I do weird shit to my rifles and they start acting funny it's like okay i probably screwed something up because i mess with it yours it's, it's just base, being weird it's in the base configuration yeah. i didn't put a suppressor on it i, I didn't do anything but yeah, as far as an out-of-the-box uh, rifle goes, it doesn't, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but it kind of lives up to Anderson's reputation. Is this the ammo, maybe? Provide our own, uh, our own dub for this. The marital issues are uh, out of control. 40% of my paycheck is unacceptable. I work hard for that money, okay? And you're not spending all of it on the kids anyway. Oh, shit, he noticed. Now he's showing off his ass. Oh, he's taking a dump. That could have been comedy gold, but he ruined it by being handsome. It's really obnoxious, yeah. What a piece of sh well, That guy is, right. yeah, he's all right, but man, he looks, he's, he looks too... We'll just put him on the channel right, you now. You stopped recording, right? So now we can talk freely about how much we don't like him? Yeah, okay, let's do it. Yeah, and then, okay, so as far as, yeah, rifles inside the LR308 ecosystem go, I have an Aero M5 lower and two uppers. Uh, the Aero M5, also like the Anderson, hues very close to the LR308 ecosystem. Uh, so, like, really, there's no reason I can't take my M5 upper, put it on your Anderson lower, well, or vice versa. That. We did it, do it that. It was a little ugly, but it looked weird as shit, but it would have worked. And like, that's good to stick within a proven ecosystem with a big aftermarket. That's great. Also, Aero does have a better reputation than Anderson. Let's be honest. Um, and they've been doing it for a while now, so there's a pretty big even if you ignore the 
the aftermarket of the LR308, you can just stick with Aero and you get a lot of options. Like they've got the old school uppers where you put on regular handguards. They've got the enhanced ones where you put on those fancy bolt-on handguards. They've got a shitload of barrels, all that stuff. So there's a lot to like about the M5 platform. And I've been testing a, you know, an 18 inch precision style upper and a 16 inch battle rifle style upper. And it's been working okay. That seems to be the recurrent yeah. theme. It, nothing ever works great unless it's this, yeah. Yeah, so I had I have, I have currently three upper receivers for the M5. One of them was out of spec, so the barrel wouldn't seat all the way in. So there was this huge gnarly gap between the feed ramps of the upper and the feed ramps of the barrel. So every round that went in would get mangled. So I would shoot like four rounds into half an inch. And I'd be like, yeah, this is good. And then I'd shoot the fifth round. It would go wild. And it's probably because it got fucking ruined on the way into the chamber. And I'd be like, what the hell's wrong with this thing? Turns out it was the upper receiver was out of spec. So I got a new upper receiver. So not the best, you might say. But it is working pretty good. Reliability, though, just, you know, kind of isn't amazing. I've, I've been trying to run the 16-inch battle rifle style one with and without a suppressor and trying to tune the gas. It's just, it's not as easy. Like, the AR-15 is so much more, more well-established. You've got all these options. I'm running a bootleg carrier in mine right now. If I have it with the full open gas setting, the thing is crazy overgassed and unreliable. Yeah. If I click it down one into the suppressed yeah. setting, it's slightly undergassed and slightly unreliable. I just can't seem to split the difference. So the Aero M5 platform, like, oh, now we're ejecting over. it's probably the best as a platform because it's it fits within the LR308, so you can go through a bunch of different manufacturers to get parts, but you can also just stay within Aero and Ballistic Advantage and still have a lot of options because they make a bunch of stuff. So as a platform goes, Aero M5 is pretty solid and the quality is pretty good and the reliability is pretty good. You know, and I've got, a, a, you know, I've got that 18 inch stainless barrel, which is very accurate. And I've got this battle rifle barrel, which is doing fine. It's not, it's not the silver bullet I think we all really, really wanted. Honestly, that T-Rex arms test, if you ignore the fact that they didn't clean it and then... Yeah, their rifle worked better than mine. They put a suppressor on it with no tuning and then it like destroyed the thing. I put a suppressor on it and tried to tune it and I made it worse. So as far as we, because we want the 308 to be like the AR-15, right? You just, you just, and you're ready to so go. So yeah, we don't really want to buy a SCAR and have unique parts and unique whatever. We sort of just would like a 308 AR-15 where there's a, a big ecosystem with a bunch of manufacturers I mean, competing really, with it, each it other. I mean, really, it just comes down to I want $20 mags. Yeah, we want, yeah, we, want to use, we want to use PMAGs. We want to have a bunch of companies competing for our business because then they do a bunch of work and we get to choose the best shit. I want to change my handguard without spending $500 for an aftermarket handguard. Yep, and we want, we want all this stuff. And is, you know, the Aero M5, Anderson, AM10, other companies working in that ecosystem probably is the, as close as we are currently to that ideal. So as I mentioned, this, this video is very similar to our uh, Brock and Hop Power Half two and a half centuries. Uh, you can get this on our subscribe star, you know, pay a dollar a month, then stop paying a dollar a month. You can even revoke it on, uh, you, can, you can even talk to your credit card company, commit absolute fraud and uh, get your $1 back and then have the playlist thing. But if you subscribe to our subscribe star, you get video qualities like this. For once, we are sufficiently drunk to say that this is the, the level of quality you will expect from this. We, we're, the actual recording is over 45 minutes long. If the video is that long, we hope we will have failed as human beings. It should be shorter. I'm just gonna upload this straight to the YouTube channel. And just including the part where you went on the bathroom break, including the part where I went for another beer, including the part where your neighbor started talking, including the part where the dog made dog noise. What about that part where you tackled the homeless man and choked him out? She's all completely loose. End of day one. Shot, shot, day one. What a good ball.